Uh, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, we are doing a live Q&A session here with Dr. Nathan McCann and uh, Board President Joe Vance. Uh, on February 8th, 2022, uh, Proposition 7 will be on ballots if you live within the Ridgefield School District boundaries. Um, so again, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, if you're not able to stay for the entire Q&A, we will be posting a live video tomorrow morning, maybe early afternoon, but it will go up tomorrow. Um, this should probably take 20 or 30 minutes total, and we're just going to be answering questions as they come in. Um, if you have questions at the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A button. You can just click on that and then type your questions in that box there and we'll uh, answer them as they come in. Um, so without any further ado, um, I just thought I would turn it over to you two for uh, some brief remarks. Um, so Mr. Vance, would you like to get us started and, and just share your thoughts on this bond? Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for those that are watching live and those that will be watching later. I thought I would just start at first with just a little bit of background uh, about myself and my family and kind of some over, arching views regarding this particular uh, this particular bond. Uh, my family and I moved to Richfield just almost 25 years ago. And when we when we were deciding where to move, we, we knew we were coming down to Clark County and we we're trying to figure out where in Clark County to move. One of the things that attracted us to Richfield uh, was the schools. They had an excellent reputation for uh, for great schools. And so we made the choice to come. We found a house in uh, Wishing Wells, and we've been in that same house now for, like I say, almost 25 years. And when we came down here, we only had three little girls. Uh, Lori was pregnant with number four, which ended up being our first boy, Jack. After being here, we in total, we've had seven kids. And now all seven of those kids have worked their way through the district. We have our very last, number seven, is a freshman at uh, Richfield High School. She's our final, our final sputter. And Richfield has just been an absolutely amazing place to raise a family. It's been a great community, great schools. We've had awesome teachers. Uh, it's just been, it's hard for me to even articulate exactly what a wonderful place it's been to raise a family. Uh, obviously, in the last few years, last several years, there's been significant growth that's taken place uh, in Richfield. Um, that's, I guess, to be expected given the nature of the land use laws in the state of Washington, even for those that might have wished that Richfield would stay as it was, it's just not possible that their, their growth was going to come. I am grateful for at least the efforts that have been made on the part of the city to help with that growth and the, the way that it's, it's, that it's happened. And quite frankly, I'm grateful for those that have come to our community. There's been great additions to our community. So I, I, am, I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate that even with the growth, um, there still is a feel about Richville. There is a community in Richville and, uh, and I appreciate appreciate that. Clearly, with that growth, uh, there's a need for, uh, for classroom space. You just can't have the type of growth that Richfield has experienced without adding classrooms. And I, I am not um, naive as to um, the time that we live in. We live in, a, obviously, a very contentious time. We, there's, a lot of, there's a lot going on. And I, I recognize that, the board recognizes that, our superintendent, Dr. McCann recognizes that. So I, I'm not naive to that, but it doesn't take away from just the fundamental fact that right now, today, we need more classrooms. By the time if this bond passes and when this bond passes uh, and we have the funds to, to, to build the classrooms that need to be built, it's already then, it's, it's, it's essentially quote unquote too late, right? We're already behind the eight ball. There is not, there, there is no, the, the, the margin of error, the kind of the, the getting out in front of this growth, that, that time has passed. Uh, we today are in urgent, urgent need of, of classrooms. And so when I talk about how great Richfield is, I, I believe it, I've experienced it, I felt it, I've witnessed the, the great, great community members that we have, but the reality is this bond uh, becomes a moment of truth for our community. 
And the moment of truth is, are we going to, are we going to step up and, and pass the bond that is so desperately needed to provide for the growth uh, in a way that would allow us to continue to have and, and offer the type of services and offer the type of um, education that we have been. Because if we don't, if we fail, then there's consequences to the failure of that. And the consequences are real. And one of the consequences is just the reputation to the community. If you're a community that can't pass a bond, that's not the type of community that the Vances were looking for 25 years ago when we came here. And that so many others were looking for when they decided that this is the place that they were coming. And so, and that, that affects all of us, you know, I mean, like I said, I only have one child left. She's not gonna, whatever is passed, it's like the new elementary school that's so desperately needed, that's not impacting Abigail. I don't have any kids that that's impacting. But I still, just as a community member and as a homeowner in the, in the community, it benefits me to be in a community that passes bonds, that, that builds schools, that provides for the basic needs uh, of, its, of its students. That's the kind of community where home, home values uh, remain stable and increase because people want to live there. If we fail to do this, uh, then there's a negative impact for everybody, whether you have kids or don't have kids, there's a negative impact. And so I guess that's my overarching plea is that this is a moment of truth for us, for those of us that consider ourselves sputters. You know, can we get it done? Can we do what is so desperately needed and something that is so critical for maintaining the type of community that we all love? and the schools that we love. And so, um, go Spuds. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Nathan, yeah. maybe you'd like to add to Go Spuds indeed. And I would, I would uh, say thank you for those comments first. And I agree, it, it is the schools that are just a tremendous tractor beam for so many families. And I'm proud to have my two kids in the district. And I was thinking as you were talking, when, uh, when I was hired to come here uh, in the spring of 14, the school district was about 2,100 students that year. Our October count this year was nearly 3,750. I think we were at 3,747. Uh, and, and I got to believe there's more as soon as kind of waiting out the pandemic. But I just wanted to put that in perspective for a second. You know, when folks say, why now? That's approximately 1,650 kids during this past eight years. Well, let's put that in like just into something more tangible. The high school is just a little over a thousand kids right now, and it's grown tremendously. And you've seen the benefits too to that, like all of the additional programming. Uh, you know, I would invite someone to see one of our uh, performing arts uh, theater performances. They're just incredible, and that's everything that's come as a result of capital investment and the student and, and family talent that's come to Richfield. But, where do you put 1,650 additional kids? And there'll be folks that might say, well, you have uh, uh, passed a bond. Well, yes, we did uh, back in 2017. Ridgefield is though by far the fastest growing community in all of Southwest Washington. It's been the fastest growing community in the state a number of times over uh, uh, during my tenure here. But you just think about that, 1,650 new students. Well, of course, additional improvements have to be made new schools to house those students. And you see it every place else in Ridgefield too. We have new roundabouts and we have new subdivisions and we have uh, a new grocery store and other things that have come. So it, it can feel stressful as everything does. Um, and there is a lot of change going on, but I'm also appreciative of the fact that you um, are reminded that like, so many great things have come with that change too, including a tremendous uh, group of new neighbors that um, that really have enriched the life of for all of us that live here in Richfield. So that um, yeah, so we're just, we're just let me just add to to that when you talk about the the positive impact. This last fall was a perfect example of it at, at our high school. Um, we had some outstanding uh, in the arts and the music and in the performing arts. Right, they they excelled and were recognized. If you look at the athletics, and again, athletics is not the end all be all, but it, the athletics is something that brought, draws a significant number of the community together. And anybody that was there at the football games at the stadium this fall witnessed what a great community that we live in. 
And oh, by the way, in, uh, in the last couple of years, for the first time in a long time, we actually have a winning, a very successful winning football program. How did that happen? Well, it happened because it wasn't because of the growth. The growth has actually contributed to that. It's, these are families that have moved here and, and are part of it are contributing to that. But it wasn't just football. Every single one of the fall sports uh, excelled and did uh, and did incredible. And again, that is the fruits of this of this growing community. And I would add the knowledgeable team plays in third right. nationally. National, huge right. accomplishment. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah. I mean, again, it's, again, it's not, so often we think about uh, athletics, it's way more than athletics. It's it's the knowledgeable, it's the arts, it's a, it's all across the sport, all, all across the board. We have we have students, and clubs, and, and teams that are absolutely excelling. And I'll just double down on with performing arts, Radium Girls, which was uh, the theater performance this fall, was... Yeah, I, there have been some amazing performances in that in that performance art space. That might be my favorite one that I've witnessed uh, there. It was incredible. And that was the first time they were back for live in-person theater since pre-pandemic. So kudos to that whole yeah. group uh, at the high school as well. And, and, so, and, and so why is it relevant to the discussion today? Well, it's relevant because what happens when a district fails to pass a bond? When uh, and particularly when you cannot build enough portables to sustain the growth, you know that um, there's consequences to that. And one of the consequences is that those that have the ability to choose where they go choose to flee, and uh, and so and that that has a direct hit on everybody else that stays. Because when you have a drain like that, it, there's no question that it affects the the knowledgeable, it affects athletics, it affects the arts. Uh, and it affects the, the learning in the classroom, for that matter, too. And, and so it's, it's, it's students and families that decide, hey, well, I don't really want to be there. If, that's, if they can't get, you know, if I, if I have to be crammed in there, or if, I, you know, if, I, if we have some kind of crazy kind of school hours because there's not enough uh, space for it, then there's no way I'm sticking around there. I'm going to go someplace else. So you lose. It's a brain drain with regards to family and students. But then it's also the administrative administrators and staff. Teachers right now want to come to Richfield. It's a great community to be in, a great place to teach. But that's not going to be sustainable unless we can unless we can pass a bond and build the capital facilities that are needed to support the growth. And that again, that's another just a critical, critical uh, reason for passing the bond. All right. Well, um, I believe I neglected to introduce myself at the beginning, so I'll do that now. Uh, my name is Joe Weigert. I'm the communications manager. And just as a reminder, in case anybody's joining us late, at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button, which you can click and then type in your questions. Um, so we will answer questions as they come in. So feel free to send anything that comes to mind. Um, but to start with, um, the first question we have is, what exactly is included in the February 2022 bond program? I'll, I'll go ahead and take that one. It's a new uh, K-4 elementary. It's going to open as part of the, the flexible approach that we're taking to deal with the growth in Richard. It will open as a K-6. It will also open, and that's about 75,000 square feet, but it's also going to open with a permanent eightplex. And so that's a modular building. It's going to be cheaper for us to, to do that than add additional portables. But we know that need is there when this opens partly for the uh, reasons that Joe suggested a couple of minutes ago, that we're behind schedule now. Um, we And schools can't be built overnight. So also in addition to that, and um, there's a really nice video with Scott Rose, who's our construction manager. I encourage folks to go on our Facebook page and look at that. We've been out there doing a tremendous amount of site prep work over this past fall, getting that ready. So people talk about things that are shovel ready. This project literally is ready uh, for building to start. Um, so we've always worked to pre-plan a key component of a bond project. It saves us inflationary costs around all of that. And then we were out there again this fall um, to get ready so that we could hit the ground running in the spring. It also includes at the high school, um, a, another building, which would be approximately 18,000 square feet, maybe just a little larger than that's gonna provide a new metal shop. That's the, the area of campus, really the area in the district that has not been touched in any substantive way since its construction. So that's a new metal shop. We're really uh, uh, intentional about investing in the trades. 
It's also going to add um, eight new general education classrooms as well as that vocational um, education component to it. Desperately needed to serve a high school that's rapidly growing. Um, and we're just, we're excited. And we, we're doing this like we've done with a number of the um, proposed bonds and successful bonds. But we're trying to do this in bite size so that the community that's here right now is not having to absorb um, all by themselves the cost of growth in Richfield, but we're doing it in a structured way so that as bonds come in the future, new growth is picking up that at that time. And I, I would just add that one of, I, I think one of the uh, important things to, or significant things about this bond is that it provides funding that will provide classrooms that, that relieve uh, uh, um, overcrowding at every one of our campuses. So even though, so if we have an elementary school, it's not that that elementary school, that, you know, so the kids that go to the elementary school, they're going to be blessed by that, that, they, that, they're, that they're at the elementary school. But each of our existing elementary schools will also be blessed because you'll have, those schools will then become smaller. They won't be as overcrowded as they are now. But again, it's not just elementary school. You know, for those that are older, oh, well, it's just don't know. For those that are in the, uh, that currently in the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, it provides capacity there because the new school is, is going to open as K-6, which then relieves the crowding that, it, that on, on that campus as well. And then obviously there's also added classrooms that are being added to the high school. So all, all of our students at all of our campuses will benefit from the, this bond package. Excellent. Uh, so next question we have here is, uh, didn't Richfield just pass a bond? Uh, why is this needed now? Yeah, I, I mean, We've, we've been intentional as a board and as a district to say that, it, that this bond is also not the last of the bonds. When you have the type of growth that we've talked about here, it was always anticipated that it would be a multi-step process. And so, uh, yes, we just passed a bond and right before that, we passed another bond a, a few years before that. And you see what we've built. I mean, we've had both, the, both of the additions at both of our elementary schools, the brand new uh, uh, five, six, seven, eight, a facility that's uh, beautiful and very functional and very well used. And then all of the improvements that have been made at the high school. Yes, there have been bonds that have passed. Those have been put to use. But the growth that's taking place, we need more classrooms. We need more facilities. And, and even when we pass this bond, it's not the last bond because the community hasn't done growing. <laughs> the growing, the, the growth is still coming and there is gonna, there's going to be a need for additional bonds. And that's, again, that's all part of the plan. As Nathan just talked about, the idea wasn't to build, well, we're going to build everything that we need right now so that over the course of 15 years, we'll grow into it. The idea is we would, we would spend only the amount that we need to spend. And then as we continue to have growth, we'll continue to add more so that the cost is kind of built, is kind of paid for and built as, as the growth comes along rather than, rather than buy something and pay for something that's not really needed right now. What this bond seeks and what the prior bonds sought or needs right then, right, you know, and right now. Um, and I would um, just like to clarify too, in case there's any confusion, the last bond was 2017, correct? Yes. When was the last levy passed? Uh, a levy is passed every three years. So the last levy was in 2019. Okay, so uh, just to make sure there's no confusion between bonds and levies, they are very different. While they're both school finance, uh, bonds are for school buildings and levies go for things like learning, um, you know, so bonds will not be used for like teacher salaries, nothing of that sort. So just in case there's any confusion between 2017, what was passed and 2019, what was passed, I just wanted to, to touch on that really quickly. Is there anything else to add on, on that before we take the next question? Okay, okay, great. Um, so if this bond is approved, how long until the new school opens? It would open in the fall of 23 which is just about as fast as we can build it. I want to give a uh, special uh, thanks to Scott Rose and the team at Colf that was out there all um, fall getting that ground prepped and ready to go. And we're confident even with some of the uh, delays and supply chain issues that have happened as a result of the pandemic, that's where I think Ridgefield has done a really nice job of planning and preparing for that. So uh, we can say with confidence that these sites will be ready for occupancy in the fall of 23. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's important for people to realize the land has been purchased, the school has been designed, pre-work, all of the grading and pre-work is done, permits have been attained. I mean, we, we literally, this is the last step. We get this, we pass the bond, we have the funding, 
boom, we're ready to start, we, we start construction and, and building this elementary school that is just absolutely critical uh, for our district. Yeah, excellent. Um, so our next question is, what is the total project cost? And then what is the cost to individual taxpayers? Yeah, so uh, I never want to make it sound like it's just this or, or it's, it's, you know, what have you. So the ask to the voters is 60, is an authorization, a bond authorization of $62,565,000. Uh, it is a lot of money, um, but it is also very, well, I want to, I want to kind of, as a parenthetical statement, make sure folks know construction management team that Richfield contracts with, the architects that we use, and ultimately the general contractors that we employ and employ through a competitive bid process um, are those same groups that have built schools in Evergreen and Vancouver. Uh, this bond will also take advantage of, if it's authorized, um, over $8 million in state assistance funding. Now that is, that's money that's gonna go to a school somewhere uh, this next year. It can come in Richfield and stay where all of those local uh, bond dollars will also stay. And something that folks have said many times, and I know Joe and I have both heard it, is well, what about impact fees? Are developers having to pay? That's how we purchased the land. That's how we paid for the early site work. And that's not extra work, by the way. That's work that had to be done at one time or another. We wanted to get a head start on that because we knew there were going to be some delays because of supply chain issues. So you've got the, we're bringing to bear developer impact fees, state assistance that were eligible because of our growth in, in Ridgefield, as well as the local authorization that we're seeking. And then let me just real, and so what does that amount to? An average home in Ridgefield right now is about $562,000. And so if you're saying, well, what does this cost a month? Like at the end of the day, this tax increase, what does that cost? And it's gonna be about $11.71 a, a month or so in uh, an additional tax versus what you'd be paying when you compare the, the um, current tax rate from the 2021 year to what the 2023 tax year would be. And I wanna add one other thing and this is getting just a little wonky, so I wanna be very careful with this, but we have always intentionally projected out a tax rate very conservatively. So we promise, um, we, we, these are projections, but what I mean by that is we assume slower growth than the growth that's actually happening in Ridgefield so that we can present a tax rate that we feel extremely confident that we can meet or actually even exceed, meaning that that tax and, rate- And historically, we have exceeded. We right? have exceeded and each so, one. So when we're saying it's $11 a month for the average thing, well, and, and historically, when we've done it, we've always beat that $11. Yes. And, and part of that is because the, what you're trying to do when you're trying to estimate what the cost is for, for, for taxpayer or for homeowner, it's it's based on we're trying to project well how you know what are the valuations going to be how, how all the different and and the growth has always been more than what we've predicted so as you bring more if there's more homes and more businesses and more that come online there's more people to carry the load and and share and share the cost I mean ultimately what it is is this this new elementary school is being paid for in part you know so we have some state money that's come in we have developer fees that are coming in. But the vast majority of it's being paid by the homeowners, by the property taxes in the city of Richmond. Well, what happens when you have more property uh, owners and, and more property taxpayers, then the load for everybody else, it, 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 it's shared. And, and we've seen that historically, and we anticipate that we'll also see that here. I think that's an excellent point. Just two more things to add to that really quickly. One, we have a much bigger commercial base than we used to have. So you have a lot more non-residential that's paying its fair share. And number two, just in the city of Ridgefield, these have been two record years for new home permitting. So you have uh, 670 homes, I think, in the 2020 year, and about 600, roughly 40 something or so homes in the 2021 year. I mean, it's that's it's a new town coming in over a two year period, and then. Obviously, for those that are well acquainted with what's going on in the 179th corridor, you see that that's opened up and you're seeing a large apartment complex going in in a very large neighborhood where they've done all the infrastructure work this past year, getting ready to put homes in there this uh, spring. To your point, that's additional folks ready to help share on this uh, uh, on the burden of, of uh, uh, building this new school. 
Sure. Yeah. And that seems like a, a good segue to point out that from the 2010 census to the 2020 census, the population more than doubled. I believe it was 116% growth. And that's not even factoring in those two years that you just mentioned. So, um, so the next question we have here is what will the new elementary school boundaries be? One of the things that we wanted to do, and I want to commend Chris Griffith and that whole team of citizens that did this, but several years ago in anticipation for the third elementary school, we did a boundary review. So you can visit our website and you can find the boundaries for the new schools. So um, they're like in terms of like, you know, if someone's like, oh, geez, I really love my school or something. All of that and how students will be assigned, that was done multiple years ago now. So folks know whether they will be at um, Sun, uh, South Ridge, Union Ridge, or as a placeholder, what we're calling New Ridge. And you can see those boundaries uh, on uh, our website. And then I'll just echo again, because I think it's a really important um, uh, statement to make. Every elementary student in the district wins as a result of this. These elementary schools cannot keep growing in size. Okay, excellent. All right, so the next question here, uh, why are the schools so overcrowded and can't we just add more portables? Yeah, I mean, uh, we talked about the growth. You just talked in the last 10 years or doubled in size. Anybody, uh, if you want to know why are the schools so 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 uh, crowded, drive around the district. And keep in mind, the district is more than just the city of Richfield. The district, our, our district boundary extends clear down to 179. Anybody that wants to drive along 179 and see the projects that are going in there, I mean, it's massive. And so, you, you know, ask the question of where would we be if the city hadn't put in the, the roundabouts? Where would we be if they hadn't added sewer, right? I mean, the sewer alone, I mean, it was a big issue in Richfield uh, 15 years ago. And you needed sewer in order to build. You go, where would you be? We, we, <laughs> you wouldn't be able to build the homes without the sewer. You know, unfortunately, the way that it works here, that you don't need the schools to build the homes. Uh, they're building the homes. The homes have been built. They're continuing to be built. And so, where, where are you going to put the students? And you know, it's like if you're stuck uh, if you're stuck on a road that's not adequate for the size of the traffic. What happens? You have a traffic jam. People get mad. People get angry. Uh, well, that's what we're that's what we're already starting to see in our schools. It's overcrowding, and that overcrowding is only going to continue as the growth continues to come. But, but why is it? Look around. The, the homes are being built uh, and, and kids are here and kids are needing a place to go. If anything, we've actually, we've actually you know, uh, nobody's happy with COVID and the impacts of COVID. One of the things, though, the, the one positive is that it's actually slowed the growth uh, in Richfield the last couple of years, which has given us a little bit of breathing space. And so some of the impacts and effects that we would have otherwise felt have been delayed. But there's no question that they're coming. They, in fact, they're here. The students are here. They're, it's not, this isn't speculation about whether they're coming. They're here and more are on the way. Excellent. And then the second part of that was about um, why are portables not a long-term solution? Yeah, I, I, I'll let Nathan add to this, but it's, there's really two reasons. First of all, uh, portables aren't free. They cost. And the, it's, it's, it's not an economically wise. If you talk to people that kind of factor it out and calculate it out, there's all sorts of reasons. It, it, economically, it doesn't make sense. You're investing all of this money into portables that is not a long-term uh, solution. Second, it's not, it's not great. The whole ambience, the whole, uh, the whole environment for learning, it's not, it's not you know, again, if the, when you're talking about people and the ideal, if, you're, if we're trying to pursue Premier in this district, you don't pursue Premier uh, uh, selecting um, uh, portables. I don't know any any professional educator that thinks portables is the is the is a great goal or a great plan uh, for for that. But the the third reason is really the, the the fundamental reason because even if you wanted to argue with the first two statements, the third reason is we do not have the space for all the portables that are needed with the growth. When when the, the type of growth. When you were talking about just since the time that Nathan has been here, 16, an increase of 1,600 students, you don't build enough portables for 1,600 students. That, that alone, you, you would have, we don't have the land for 1,600 students. So you're going to go buy a, you're going to go purchase land and then put a, put a portable farm. It just, it, I mean, it's just, it's not, that is not, it's, it's, it's fundamentally not an option given the, the amount. If this was just neat, we needed a couple of portables at each of the schools to, 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 to handle the growth, yeah, that might be an option. 
We already have portables at all of our schools, and we're going to continue to have more portables at our schools. But portables alone will not uh, accommodate all of the growth that is here and all the growth that's coming. Yeah, you know, that got me thinking, too. Like, if you take a number like just that growth, that that would be like the La Center School District. Like, and yeah. We're going to put all of the center school district in portables. Yeah. With no, I mean, how do you, how do you, from a safety standpoint, from a teaching standpoint, even from a, even from a building, I mean, you put, you build, you create a portable farm, you're going to need some kind of permitting to provide yes. for that. Portables were never designed as uh, that. Yeah, this is going to be your comp. This is going to be your campus. And that's exactly what we have. We have, we, we need new uh, uh, school campuses. Uh, so portables, uh, help in short-term situations. They have, they have, they, they help kind of bridging the gap. They help when you're adding one or two here. They do not help when you have the type of growth that we're experiencing. And since you mentioned radium girls, I mean that makes me think as well. It's not just about classroom space. It's also, you know, space for theater or gym class or playground space or even a lunchroom. Uh, portables can't really provide those large spaces that are so. Uh, vital to complete student needs. They're terrible for student density. Joe hit on it. They're, they are no good for student safety. Um, they're really difficult to maintain because you always have students walking in and outside. So they're a custodial challenge on a daily basis. They are a very practical short-term stopgap as a school is growing, as you wait to get to a size where maybe something like a bond in a new school makes sense, they are not a strategy that a serious school district looks at. If we were to, it's not as easy if even if someone wanted to say, well, it's where you were going to build new roads, just plant some portables there. Well, you're going to have to bring sewer out there because the city doesn't allow you to uh, build and do that via septic. Uh, you're going to have to have all those core spaces that you're going to have to build on top of that. Um, and we don't have, to Joe's point, we don't have enough land in the district. We'd still, if we said portables was our option, we would still have to go out and bond to purchase land because we would not have enough money in impact fees to drive a portable uh, yeah. strategy all by itself. Particularly if you look at uh, the, the uh, Sunset View Ridge campus, uh, the growth that's coming there between our five, six, seven, eight. We do not have space to put all the port. You would cover up athletic fields that are there. You would cover up, you would destroy whatever architecture we actually have that the, the creates. And, you know, call me crazy, but actually having a building designed a certain way that adds to the aesthetics and adds to the learning experience, you want to destroy that with a bunch of portables. Even if you want, we're willing to do that, you don't have the space to do it for all the portables that you would need to accommodate the growth that's there. All right, great. Um, so we only have time for a couple more questions. Um, so unfortunately, if we can't get to all of them tonight, we do have a very comprehensive FAQ on our website. Uh, if you go to richfieldsd.org and click on menu and go to the bond page from there, um, the FAQ is all over that website. So if we don't get to your question tonight, we do apologize. Um, and you know, again, we do have questions or answers to almost any question you might have on our website. And if we don't have it there, uh, our contact information is on the website. You can always send any inquiries to communications at ridgefieldsd.org. And that's a good way to get in touch with uh, whoever you need you know, to find the answer to whatever question you might have. Um, so I guess we'll wrap up with uh, why isn't the old View Ridge building uh, being used as a school now? I know this is a question that comes up from time to time. And so it's it's just great to remind folks in 2017, in preparation for that bond, there were a couple of decisions to be made. And there was a capital facilities advisory committee that met. And that group then reported and gave presentations and recommendations to the school board. And that group was a group of volunteer citizens and anybody that wanted to serve on that committee could be on that committee. Couple of things. This this particular building that we're in now, what was View Ridge and is now the uh, the RAC, the Ridgefield Administrative and Civic Center. It's a little over forty thousand square feet. The View Ridge Sunset Ridge Complex is one hundred and forty five thousand square feet. This sits on approximately five uh, acres. Uh, the View Ridge Complex portion of the school portion of that whole uh, View Ridge and Roar Complex that portion is about twenty eight um, acres. There was, for those that have been here long enough, they will remember that um, that and that school only had some of the district's fifth and sixth graders at Union Ridge at the time. The traffic nightmare, so the circulation capacity of downtown Ridgefield could not sustain the number of students 
that were in this very landlocked Union Ridge, View Ridge uh, sector of town and the land that we ha uh, had. So we had two choices. We could have uh, revitalized this campus for students, but it was impractical for each of the reasons I just suggested. It's the land capacity. There wasn't, the school could not be built big enough and the investment to bring it up to required code to serve students uh, would have been uh, very expensive. Or we could take that money and use it, uh, that same eligibility, and use it to build uh, the new campus as an investment towards the new Sunset Ridge and View Ridge. The conditions the state have at that time, though, are that if you do that, that building can no longer be used for K-12 during the day education. What can and is the RAC used for? It's got an early learning center, which is perfectly appropriate. That's a preschool program. It has it houses a significant number of community education programs, both for our student, our K-12 population, again, allowable, as well as uh, many adult uh, things. So pickleball, adult basketball, et cetera. Lots of club sports teams use this facility and rent this facility as well. It's the home to three of the uh, Richfield cities. Um, uh, departments, uh, finance, community development, um, uh, both are housed down here. And forgive me for forgetting the third department right now, the public works are all uh, headquartered down here. The city shared and has a long-term lease to lease some of this space. And this is the hub of, um, and the gateway to downtown Richfield. Exceptionally proud of it. I invite anyone to come downtown, see all of the partners that are housed here. But the practical answer is it was not an option yeah. that was viable. Yeah, and, and let me just let me just add to that point. So once the decision was made that you can't, because we were we were needing to build the five, six, seven, eight campus, and that campus could not fit on the space that where the old uh, View Ridge was. It just simply the, not the, the 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 land itself wasn't big enough to support it. The infrastructure around it with transportation and all of that was nowhere near capable of supporting it. So the, for that very reason, we the decision was made to build it across the street from the high school. So then the question comes, well, you have all those classrooms there. You, you, Joe, you're telling me you're desperate need of classrooms. Why don't you just use the classrooms that are there in here? I mean, it's nice that you're doing some of these other things, but, but what was really desperately needed is classrooms. Why aren't you using them? The, the answer to that is the state doesn't allow us. We, in, in order to build that campus up there, the five, six, seven, eight campus, we, we, had, we had funds that came from the state that were based on growth. And, and, the, and the condition to those funds were that you not use, because it was, we were building new in lieu of the old. And so in, 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 in order to get that new money in lieu of the old money uh, or the old building, uh, there was a condition that you cannot continue to use those classrooms for K through 12. That's why we've repurposed it. You know, we haven't just destroyed the building. We've used it for other purposes. And I would, again, I would echo what Nathan said. They're a very good purpose. I don't, I'm, I don't, I don't need to, well, I don't think anybody needs to apologize for what we're using the building for. In a growing community like Richfield, these, the a facility like this is needed. Uh, and, it's, and it's being used in uh, very, very important ways and very critical ways and very productive ways. Uh, but the bottom line is, we did not have the option to continue to use it as classrooms. That was not an option in order to get the state funding that was so critical to getting the, the six, uh, six, seven, uh, uh, five, six, seven, or wait, six, seven, seven, eight, or wait, I say five, five, six, seven, eight, eight building. Yeah. Uh, building. And that brings us back is right to where we started too. We, you, you asked a question a little while ago about funding mechanisms for this particular bond. We would all like we're sitting on over eight million dollars of state assistance that we'll be eligible for. We flat out wouldn't. I mean, there are a few things the state takes more seriously or more punitive on than if you were to uh, one for a school district. We shouldn't be knowingly violating uh, state law. Beyond that, they're just not joking around about that. You will then uh, forfeit your right to any additional state assistance if you were to do this. We've um, the state's very intentional about that. That's the rules that they expect all 295 districts in the in the state to comply with. So uh, that's where we are. Yeah, let me just add to that. I mean, one of the questions that we often will give is, well, you know, it's the people well intentioned, and I understand it, man. I'm a taxpayer too. Well, why won't why don't they pay for it? Why won't they pay for it? Like, it's always like. Trust me, we've looked, we've searched. If there was another way to pay for these classrooms, 
We would, we, it's not like our first choice is all we want to, each of us, the taxpayers wants to pay for it. I, trust us, we've looked and searched. Uh, the popular one is the developers. Look, we have the highest impact fees in the county by a large measure. So we're doing, yes, the, 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 the developers here in Richfield are paying their share uh, based on impact fees. But those impact fees are not enough to pay for all of it. Do they contribute to it? Yes. Are they are they are the rates higher than anywhere else by a large margin in the county? Yes. Now the reality is is that there aren't any other options. And I would you know for those that think there might be, I would encourage you to talk to somebody that's done the research and done the done the work. There just there isn't another option to this. Uh, we the, the bond is the mechanism in the state of Washington to build classrooms, and we need classrooms. All right. Well, with that note, I think uh, that's a wrap on our evening. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Uh, again, this will be posted online tomorrow. And as always, you can find information at www.ridgefieldsd, like school district, ridgefieldsd.org. Thank you again. Good night.